Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. We're going to begin our study this evening with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the Sabbath hours. And we are thankful, Lord, how you instruct us, how you guide us. We're thankful for the trials of this past week and for the blessings as well. We're thankful, Lord, for the conviction that you bring to our hearts and that you are still merciful to us in spite of ourselves, in spite of our sins. And we just pray, Lord, that this Sabbath will be truly a blessing to each one. Help us to understand your words, your words to us individually, and your words to us as a movement. As we look at the message of righteousness by faith, Lord, we know our thoughts are not your thoughts. We know that you understand so much more than it is possible, and you are so much more than it is possible for us to understand. But we know, Lord, that through your spirit, you can give us the light that we need, and so we ask now for that light, that strength, that this Sabbath will be a blessing that will give us strength for this week ahead and for those trials that we are unprepared for. We just pray, Lord, that now, in the time that we have, that you can be close to each one of us. We pray for each person that your Holy Spirit can bring this power and this conviction to our lives. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, good evening again, and uh, happy Sabbath. We, on, on Sabbath afternoon last week, um, we were looking at, at uh, this, this document here, A.T. Jones, 1893 General Conference Bulletin and his his sermons that he was presenting there. And, and people who've been watching this know um, how we connect that history with ours because he's understanding that uh, the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down in his time. And, and we can agree that he's correct, but he's on a different line than we are on. Now, um, on page 264 of this, this is page 225 or something of this document, but page 264 is the pagination that came from the General Conference Bulletin articles itself, uh, is my understanding of it. So that page 264, the 26th day of the fourth month is kind of interesting. Of course, we're always going to run into these numbers. Uh, each page is numbered, but... Um, now he's here, he's quoting from these Catholic books, comparing the idea of justification by faith that we understand from God's word with that of the Catholic idea. And he makes this case that many Adventists actually have Catholic ideas. And um, we talked about it uh, last week in that the, the terminology keeps changing. So what's acceptable for one generation um, yeah, becomes a bit more transparent for another. We start to see through what's being said. And so the language has changed, but the ideas behind it, the Catholic idea of justification by faith, it's really based upon an idea that in some way we have to change God, where the biblical idea is that God changes us. And, and this goes all the way back even to... Um, the study of, of pagan religions. So one of the things about astrology, Babylonian astro astrology that we saw when we studied the book of Ezekiel, is that uh, the Babylonians tried to manipulate God and, and their destiny by predetermining uh, what was going to occur in the sky so that they could avo avoid the evil omens um, and, and somehow get in God's favor. So somehow trick God in some way, maybe even is a better idea. 
Now, you know, so for instance, if you're going to have a battle, um, you don't want to have a battle during an eclipse of the moon or an eclipse of the sun or something like that, um, because that's a bad sign. Of course, if it's a bad sign for you, it should be a bad sign for the other side too, I would think, but somehow they never take that into consideration. Um, so the idea really goes back way back when he says it's Satan's doctrine. Of course, that's much further back than Babylon. Um, because that's really the mind of Satan. Now, as a Christian, in order to, to understand righteousness by faith, I'm just going to go away from this doc document for a moment and just go to the Bible. Now, we had a study here in the building uh, today, and my friend Ryan brought up, because he, he's been studying righteousness by faith, and he brought up the first time that we get this idea of righteousness by faith is Genesis 15 verse six. And this is the story of God's covenant with Abraham, where they divide the animals into half and in Christ in the form of a uh, burning lamp and a smoking furnace is going to pass between these carcasses. And so we have this idea of the chiasm of a cross, right? The 70th week. Um, and we know, of course, that this is repeated in Hebrews uh, chapter 11 verse 8 regarding Abraham. So it says, uh, by faith to Abraham, when he was called out to go out into a place which he should afterward, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing where he went. Right. And so it's going to talk about Abraham, all the things he did. did. Um, and let me see here. He looked for a city that has foundations. Yeah, so it, it's just going to talk about his faith, but the faith of Abraham. But here, um, I think it was another verse as well. Uh, oh, it's, it's just going to say, that he was found. There's some other verse um, in Paul's writings. Just can't find it. Anyway, somebody can find that. Uh, but I, I believe this verse is quoted uh, somewhere. But uh, I'm not sure. Now, um, but anyway, we have Abraham is the first one mentioned regarding this being counted to him for righteousness. So this is justification by faith. He just believed God and it was accounted to and was counted to him for righteousness. Now, um, and just, uh, just looking at the Hebrew here. Yeah, so this idea means to compute, make account of, count, um, reckon, So, so this idea of righteousness by faith goes back to Abraham. Now, and, and it goes to this covenant, to the cross. So it's the cross of Christ that gives us righteousness by faith. And I'm not explaining well. Uh, Romans 4 on Abraham's, uh, there it is, 411. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be a father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them. And uh, unto them also. And we're going to see here that, that this is mentioned in the context of circumcision. And circumcision, of course, is a sign of the covenant of the righteousness by faith. So thanks for that, Karen. And um, so I wanted to look at that a little bit. There's Because when we're dealing with this Catholic idea and we're comparing it with what we think, it's easy to sort of say, well, that's not me. I don't think like a Catholic. But we've, we've modified our language. So that what, what we really need to look at is not so much the language we use, 
uh, for describing righteousness by faith, but understand what our attitude and actions show. Are we try or do we think and do we act? Do we feel somehow that we have to change God's mind? Or are we seeking to be changed ourselves? Are we asking God to change us? Are we judging our, our actions based upon this standard and saying, well, I fall short, um, so I'm going to need to measure up better? Or are we going to accept the righteousness that is by faith and trust that God is, is working in us while we seek to see the sins in ourselves and to be corrected? And, and so it's some, some ways it can appear to be a fine line. <clears throat> so um, we're going to go on and continue reading here. To do these acts with the view of being justified is, they say, so this is on page 367 of the Catholic book. To do these acts with the view of being justified is, they say, like giving a penny to the queen to obtain from her a royal gift. What saith the Lord? Page 51 steps to Christ. This is the lesson which Jesus taught while he was on earth. The gift which God promises us, we must believe, we do receive, and it is ours. Then which is Christianity? Congregation, the last. But the Catholic Church says that this is Protestantism. It is true, thank the Lord. So what they're doing is they're talking about what they think about Protestants. So this, to do the acts with the view of being justified is, they say, like giving a penny to the queen of, to obtain from her a royal gift. So this is the Protestant view according to the Catholics, right? Is that, is that what's being said? Am I, am I getting this right? So the idea that we are justified is to be a gift from God. It's undeserved. We must believe we do receive, Ellen White says, and it is ours. Then which is Christianity, right? So we know that if we believe, we can receive this gift. So he's going to continue reading from the Catholic work. He says, come as you are, they add, so talking again about Protestants, you cannot be too bad for Jesus. Um, thank the Lord that this is not Catholic doctrine. Thank the Lord it is no part of the beast or his worship, nor the image and his worship. Let us put them together. What saith the Lord? Page 27 of Steps to Christ. We can do nothing of ourselves. We must come just as we are. Again, on page 55, Steps to Christ. Jesus loves to have us come just as we are, sinful. What is sinful? Congregation full of sin. Does Jesus love to have us come to him just as we are, full of sin? Congregation, yes. Does he? Congregation, yes, sir. Then let us be Protestants. Let us have the third angel's message, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus loves to have us come just as we are, sinful helpless, dependent. We may come with all. How much? All. Our weakness, our folly, our sinfulness, and fall at his feet in penitence. It is his glory to encircle circle us in the arms of his love and to bind up our wounds, to cleanse us from all impurity. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength, purity, and righteousness in Jesus who died for them. That is the gift of God. That is his gift. So that was, of course, from Desire of Ages. That is the gift of God. That is his gift, a free gift without money, without price. And I take it gladly and everlastingly thank him for it. This is the Lord's idea of justification by faith. The other is Satan's idea. Let us read from the Catholic book again. Through faith alone, and there's actually steps to Christ, 
um, through faith alone in his promise, they Protestants assert. So again, they're talking about what Protestants say and what and how they reject this idea of faith alone. So Protestants assert you can you can and should accept Christ's merits, seize Christ's redemption and his justice, appropriate Christ to yourself, believe that Jesus is with you, is yours, that he pardons your sins, and all this without any preparation and without any doing on your part. Good. Thank the Lord. That is Protestantism. And Catholics know that it is Protestantism. Do you know it? On page 53, Steps to Christ, let us see what the Lord says. It is the will of God to cleanse us from sin, to make us his children, and to enable us to live a holy life. So we may ask for these blessings and believe that we receive them and thank God that we have received them. It is our privilege to go to Jesus and be cleansed and to stand before the law without shame or remorse, um, which is Ephesians 1 verse 3 that's uh, referenced there. Um, Congregation, amen. Without any need of doing penance? Congregation, yes. Thank the Lord. Now, the Catholic book, again, in fact, that however deficient you may be in all other dispositions, which Catholics require, on however loaded with sins, if you can only trust in Jesus, that he will forgive your sins and save you, you are by that trust alone forgiven, personally redeemed, justified, and placed in a state of salvation. So, Again, they're characterizing um, Protestant views of justification. So, Joan says, let us read on page 33, Steps to Christ again. When Satan comes to tell you that you are a great sinner, look up to your Redeemer and talk of his merits. That which will help you is to look to his light. Acknowledge your sins, but tell the enemy that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and that you may be saved by his matchless love. Jesus asked Simon a question in regard to two debtors. One owed his Lord a small sum, and the other owed him a very large sum, but he forgave them both. And Christ asked Simon which debtor would love his Lord the most. Simon answered, he to whom he forgave most. We have been great sinners, but Christ died that we might be forgiven. The merits of his sacrifice are sufficient to present to the Father in our behalf. Are they in fact? Congregation, yes, sir. Good. There is a great deal more in this Catholic work that I will not take time to read now. It goes on to define what faith is. Now, think carefully, because I've met people all the way along who think that this very thing is faith, which this Catholic book calls faith. I read page 368. So here's what the Catholics think. The word faith in scripture sometimes means confidence in God's omnipotence and goodness that he can and is willing to cure or benefit us by miraculous interposition. Mostly it refers to revealed truths and signifies belief in them as such. No one has a right to give to the word faith a new meaning and take it, for instance, to signify reliance on Jesus for being personally saved through his very reliance, this very reliance alone, unless Jesus Christ or the apostles had in some instance clearly attributed such a meaning to the word faith and taught the doctrine of trusting Christ for personal salvation as the only requisite for justification. No one should attach a particular meaning to the word faith without having a good warrant in scripture or in divine tradition. Now in many passages of Holy Scripture, in which saving faith is plainly spoken of. By faith is not meant a trust in Christ for personal salvation, but evidently a firm belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, that what is related of him in the gospel is true, and that what he taught is true. So we can see that um, uh, there's some problems here. And on, on page 370, it defines faith, and I will read that before reading the opposite. These texts, all of which refer to saving faith, prove beyond a doubt that not trust in Christ for personal salvation, but the faith of the creed, the faith in revealed truths. 
Um, so Jones goes on, now what is faith according to that, the faith of the creed? They simply draw up a statement of stuff that they call the doctrine of God, and then you believe that, and you do your best, and that passes for justification by faith. Whether the creed is drawn up in actual writing or whether it is somebody's idea that they want to pass off by a vote in a general conference, it makes no difference in principle. The creed is there, and subscription to it is just that kind of faith. And there are people here who remember a time four years ago and a place, Minneapolis, when three distinct dis direct efforts were made to get just such a thing as that fastened upon the third angel's message by a vote in a general conference. What somebody believed set up that up as the landmarks and then vote to stand by the landmarks, whether you know what the landmarks are or not, and then go ahead and agree to keep the commandments of God and a lot of other things that are going that you are going to do. And that was to be passed off as justification by faith. We were we not told at that time that the angel of God said, do not take that step. You do not know what is in that. I can't take time to tell you what is in that, but the angel has said, do not do it. Jones says the papacy was in it. That was what the Lord was trying to tell us and get us to understand. The papacy was in it. It, it was like it has been in every other church that has come out from the papacy. They would run a little while by faith in God and then fix up some man's idea of doctrine and vote to stand by that and vote that that is the doctrine of this church. And then that is the faith of the creed and then followed up with their own doing. Is there anybody in this house who was there at that time that cannot see now what was what that was back there? Then, brethren, is it not time to cut loose? If it takes the very life out of us, it will take the very light of life out of us. It will crucify us with Jesus Christ. It will cause us such a death to sin that we never dreamed of in our lives before. It will take all that papal mind out of us all that iron spirit out of us. And it will put there the divine, tender, loving mind of Jesus Christ that wants no creed because it has Christ himself. Well, let me read that again and then the contradiction of it here. It seems as though one book was written for the other, brethren, which of the books shall we follow? Ah, steps to Christ. That is what it is. And then it is steps with him when we have stepped to, then it is steps with Christ. Now, I will read that over again and then read the opposite. <clears throat> now, in many passages of Holy Scripture in which saving faith is plainly spoken of, by faith is not meant a trust in Christ for personal salvation, but evidently a firm belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, that what is related of him in the gospel is true. And that what he taught is true. That is Catholic faith. Now, what is the Lord's definition? His idea of faith. Page 69, Steps to Christ. When we speak of faith, there is a distinction that should be borne in mind. There is a kind of belief that is wholly distinct from faith. The existence and power of God, the truth of his word, are facts that even Satan and his hosts cannot at heart deny. So Jones goes on, did not the evil spirits tell Jesus that he was Christ? Congregation, yes. Then the devil, Satan and his hosts, do believe in the existence and power of God, that his word is true, and that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Satan and his hosts believe all that, but that is not faith. How much power is there in their belief to work good in their lives? None at all. They have no faith, but just this is the Catholic faith, faith, isn't it? What kind of faith is that then? That is satanic faith. That is all it is, satanic belief, as this puts it. But yet the papacy passes it for faith. And whoever passes that for faith is a papist, even though he professed to be a Seventh-day Adventist. But I read it on from steps to Christ. 
The Bible says that the devils also believe and tremble. But this is not faith. Where there is not only a belief in God's word, but a submission of the will to him, where the heart is yielded to him and the affections fixed upon him, there is faith. Jones goes on, that is the truth of justifying faith. That is righteousness by faith. That is the faith that works. Thank the Lord. Not a faith that believes something a way off, that keeps the truth of God in the outer court, and then seeks by his own efforts to make up the lack. Not that, no, but faith that works. It itself is working. It has a power in it to manifest God's will in man before the world. That is righteousness by faith. The righteousness which faith obtains, which it receives, and which it holds, the righteousness of God. I continue reading from Steps to Christ. Faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Through this faith, the heart is renewed in the image of God. I do not need to read any more, as this is enough to show the contrast, and the time is far gone. This is enough to show that the papal doctrine of justification by faith is Satan's doctrine. It is simply the natural mind, depending upon itself, working through itself, exalting itself, and then covering it all, all up with a profession of belief in this, that, and the other, but having no power of God. Then, brethren, let it be rooted up forever. In paganism, Satan led the mind of man to put itself on an equality with God without any covering at all. Then Christ came into the world, revealing the true gospel as never before. Christ in man, man justified by faith in him and faith alone, a faith which has divine life in it, a faith which has divine power in it, a faith which lives and works, a faith that brings all things to him who has it and restores the image of God in the soul. And Satan took that same carnal mind, which in paganism had made itself equal with God, and now he covered it with his own idea of faith and passed it off as justification by faith and exalted the chief representative of it above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that as God he sitteth in the place of worship of God, showing himself that he is God. Oh, that we may have the mind of Christ and not the carnal mind. Oh, that we may have the mind of Christ um, and not the mind of Satan. Oh, that we may have the Lord's idea of justification by faith and not Satan's idea of it. Oh, that we may receive the Lord's idea of righteousness by faith and not Satan's. Then shall we indeed receive the latter reign the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. Brethren, let us believe the third angel's message. Now, I hope that the way is clearly open before us to study as it is the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Let us go at it in the fear of God, seeking for his Holy Spirit to make it plain to us so that the teacher of righteousness may teach us righteousness according to righteousness. Now, um, <clears throat> we need to have a bit of a discussion about this. And I don't know quite how to go about it. But if we take this last paragraph here from his 12th presentation, um, when he's talking about the third angel's message, what, what is he talking about? what we've seen so far in Jones. What is what has he seen about the third angel's message? What is it? I would say it's dethroning self and upholding Jesus, exalting him. Okay. Yeah. So... When he went back, when we go back to the beginning of what he talked about the third angel's message, 
I mean, he had this focus upon, because we're trying to understand Jones, how he's looking at things. And it's not the superficial way in which we generally look at, at these statements, that especially statements in the spirit of prophecy. So we know that the third angel's message is, is the third angel's message. That is, there are two messages that precede it. And Jones makes that clear when he reads the spirit of prophecy statement regarding that. But the third angel's message is this conflict between um, the power of the state with that of God, right? That's how he puts it. Because he talks about the power of the state, what the state has done, how they have um, rejected the gospel. They've rejected the constitution. And that if we are going to stand against the power of the world, we're going to have to do that, not by earthly powers, but by God's power. Right? Is that how, how am I characterizing that correctly? Because that's the first part of his series in, in, in this series. That's the first point that he points out. He spends a lot of time dealing with what had happened with the Constitution and why we're not going to be signing petitions anymore. And that we have to seek the power of God because we're not, we're not able to compete against the power of the state. So the third angel's message is this conflict. I mean, he doesn't say it this way, but it really is the great controversy. Right. And so it's, it's a message of warning. It's empowered by the angel of Revelation 18. Now, why is it important in Jones' mind that the angel of Revelation 18 joins the third angel? If you can remember back to what he has said. Why is this important? Because this is where he says that we now can't sign petitions. That, that the government is in control. They have the power. We, we can't change them. Anybody remember? I know it was a long time ago. Okay, so petitioning the state, Esther, Daniel, and Paul also probably others did so. So why does he say that, that we're not going to do that anymore? Because he, he talks about the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down. And at that point, it changes our relationship to petitioning the government. Does anybody remember his reason? Isn't petitioning the government saying that the government is in charge of us? Okay, right. So now he, he recognizes before, under the Constitution, it's a Constitution of the people for the people, right? Is that the way it said? Agreed. Okay. So once the Constitution had been set aside, is there any point of petitioning the government? No, there is not. Right. Okay. And, and I believe that Jones is correct, that something happened in that history of time that actually has changed forever the church's relationship to the state, or it should have. Because the church didn't do its job, we've been here a lot longer than we needed to be. Now, it's, it's interesting, too, in this um, this presentation, number 12, that Jones is going to be addressing, well, he addressed um, the creed. Why is that important in this context of, of the overall context of Jones' messages so far? 
Because what is the creed really doing as far as the gospel is concerned? I mean, we've seen it worked out in Adventism. People understand my question. Because the creed is just a belief in a set, uh, um, a series of statements, but even the devils believe and tremble. So, so what ends up happening with the creed in the context of the third angel's message? People begin to replace the word of man over the word of God. Okay. And, and the word of man over the word of God is, is what? Idolatry. Okay, yeah, it is idolatry. But in the context of the third angel's message. Would it be rich man? Okay, you, it's, it's what? The rich man? No, rich um, witchcraft. Oh, witchcraft. Okay, yeah. it is. I mean, those things are correct. But in the context of the third angel's message, the third angel's message is righteousness by faith in verity, right? We equate the third angel's message with righteousness by faith. Isn't it a rejection of righteousness by faith? It's also a rejection of the gift of God. Yeah. Because, well, yes. Because if we believe that just believing in something in word is faith, we end up like the Catholics. We need to have a statement of beliefs. We need to have those voted upon so that we can all agree upon them. And of course, when that happens, they all get watered down, right? Because you have to state things in such a way that everybody can agree, at least the people on the committee. They have to agree with the wording. And so they're going to write a wording that's more inclusive, right? So that more people can agree with it. Would you agree? That's what happens when you write up a creed. So you write it in the most vague language possible. One is so that it can be manipulated. It can fit all of the different beliefs that exist. When Parminder wrote up his creed, because he didn't write up baptismal vows, did he? Those aren't really baptismal vows, were they? They're more his expressions. Well, they were actually a, a, a creed. Because I, I got baptized, you know, at, into the Adventist church on December 25th, 1982. And I had 13 baptismal vows. I didn't have a, a whole statement of beliefs. And they were just basically one line baptismal vows. They weren't long paragraphs. I was basically just professing my belief in Christ, in the Bible, in the Sabbath, and that I was pledging to obey these things, to not, you know, drink alcohol, um, to not go to, you know, gamble and to go to theaters and, and be involved in all these different things, that I would take care of my health, follow the laws of health, and, and dress that I would dress modestly and behave in such a way, right? Those were baptismal vows. It wasn't a creed. It wasn't about the statement of beliefs of what intellectually I understood about everything. It was more about my commitment to God, right? That's what baptismal vows are. But a statement of beliefs, the 27 or now 28 fundamental beliefs, um, even though it says in the preamble that it's not a creed, it's used like a creed, right?
And if somebody says, well, I believe in those things, does it really matter what his life is like? I mean, I mean, obviously there's obvious things that he couldn't do, but, but there are some things he can actually be pretty much a sinner and still be an active member in the church as long as he professes to believe in the creed, correct? People can believe in the creed, commit adultery, but still be elders in the church, correct? Right. Correct. I've seen it happen many times. An elder divorce his wife and marry somebody else's wife, and yet still remains an elder in the church because he professes a belief in the creed. And, and we don't even know all the time whether they really think any of those things or not. It doesn't really matter. As long as he's not teaching something against the creed publicly, we assume that he's still in agreement with the creed. Right? We only use the creed when somebody starts teaching something that we don't like that's contrary to our understanding or brings conviction or has us see something in a way that we never saw it before. And so we claim that this person is somehow in opposition to the church because he's teaching things that are strange doctrines that aren't written in the creed. Now, is everything that Adventists believe written in our creed? If you look at the 28 fundamental beliefs and you start looking at the things that we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, most of what we believe as Adventists is not included in the fundamental beliefs, correct? Very correct. Yeah. It's just some of the things that some committee decided that we can at least all agree upon, as long as we write it in vague enough a manner um, that we can then all give some kind of uh, intellectual assent to it. But it does nothing to save us. A What's that, Chris? I'm sorry. I was going to say, isn't that kind of the basis for ecumenism, commonality? Yes. Now, now originally, when we, we made statements of belief in Adventism, uh, this was... This was more for, not for Adventists, but for non-Adventists. And, and you'll see it sometimes on people's websites. They'll, they'll put up what they believe because they, they want you to know where they come from. Here's what we believe. We believe the Bible is the word of God. You know, we believe you know, this or that or the other thing. Uh, they're not putting it up as a creed. And, and of course, our statement of beliefs professes not to be a creed right in, in the beginning of it. But we've seen it used like a creed, have we not? Because if you're going to disfellowship somebody over the fact that they somehow teach something that's not in the statement of beliefs, then that person, can, and it doesn't have to be something that contradicts the statement of belief. It just has to be something that's not in the statement of beliefs, correct? Because is there anywhere in the statement of beliefs that says something about the 2520 is not truth? But if you teach it, you're going to be disfellowshipped. That's the way they're approaching it. Yeah. So if it's not in there, and we know that this has happened, people would say it's not in the creed. It's not what we teach. So you can be disfellowshipped. And we can see that that's totally contrary to the gospel. <clears throat> okay, so, so Jones has, so I kind of skipped to the end there. Um, but if we go back and we look at this, the third angel's message, he says, let us believe in the third angel's message. So here he's not talking about the type of faith that the Catholics are talking about. So this third angel mess, angel's message encompasses the entire gospel. In some ways, the third angel's message is not about doctrinal details as much as a belief about the purpose of the gospel. 
that the purpose of the gospel is to reveal Christ's character to the world. And that's why righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, in reality. So he says, now I hope that the way is clearly open before us to study as it is the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. So when he talks about the righteousness of God, is that something that we can understand? Could, for instance, could we set up a, a statement of beliefs that explains what the righteousness of God is, that everyone could understand it? Because it's greater than the mind of man. It's incomprehensible. Apart from the Holy Spirit instructing us as to God's character, the righteousness of God is the opposite to man's ideas, to man's ideas of righteousness. So if we're going to study the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, where do we see the righteousness of God? Don't we see it in Christ? And, and if we see it in Christ and we see it by faith, what does that mean? Because faith is not just an intellectual assent to some set of doctrines, but it's by a dependence, a reliance, a trust, an abiding trust in Christ. So the only way that we can know the righteousness of God the only way it can be worked out in the life is by faith of Jesus Christ. So can we see what righteousness by faith is according to A.T. Jones? Do we see it better than we did before as, as we've gone through 12 of these sermons? We should be able to see it better. Mm -hmm. You know, that the mind of God is not like the mind of man. The mind of man is enmity against God, is enmity, right? It's, it's the enmity of God, right? It's at complete opposites of God's. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So the idea of the Catholic that somehow... This mind that is enmity against God can somehow prepare the way to get itself worked up a little bit of righteousness so that somehow God can then work in that person's life. That's contrary to the gospel. We need to understand that enmity. So then he says, let us all, let us go at it in the fear of God. So when Jones is talking about going at it, it's kind of a bit of a idiomatic American expression, in the fear of God. So we're gonna, we're gonna approach this, this relationship with Christ, this knowing of the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ, through faith in Christ, through dependence upon Christ, we're gonna, we're gonna accomplish this because we're gonna approach it in the fear of God. So what does he mean by that? Because he's talked about this earlier. Do we fear man? Well, let's put it this way. If we fear man, do we, do we fear God? Is it possible to fear man and fear God at the same time? No. no. Okay. Why?
if we have the fear of God, can we possibly fear man? No, there ain't no fear in man if you fear God. <laughs> right. Because we put ourselves on the side. We, we recognize, I mean, Jesus says, um, fear not him that can destroy the body, but get, that can cast both soul and body um, into, into to Gehenna fire, right? So we don't fear him that can hurt the body. We fear him that can destroy us completely. And if we have the fear of God, there's no need for the fear of man. There's no reason for it because we have God on our side if we fear God. Now, most of us really just fear men because why do we not do bad things? Why does the average person avoid doing bad things? Is it the fear of God or the fear of man? Fear of man because he doesn't want to be caught. He doesn't want to be caught, right? So you can have the fear of man, and that can stop you from doing some bad things in certain circumstances. But in other circumstances, you could do those same things that you wouldn't do in front of some men. You could do in front of others. Right. That's the problem with the fear of man. It's not sufficient to motivate us to do good because all we care about is the opinion of man. Now, if we have the fear of God, can we do something in, in reality? Can we do something that God isn't going to know about? Can we hide from God? No, we can't. So if we have the fear of God, we have a fear that should always keep us from sin, right? If we really have the fear of God, if we really knew who God was, we wouldn't do sin. Now, we, we fear God. Um, do we, why, why would we fear God? Do we fear God because of his um, because he's powerful, or we do fear God because he is love. Not that those are opposites, but you understand what I'm getting at. Can you can you truly fear a God that you don't believe is a God of love? Remember the guy who hid his talent. Did he truly fear God? Nope. No. Nope. Now he said, you are a hard and austere man, you know, the not God, but in the context of the, the persons uh, representing God, the husbandman or the, whatever he was, I can't remember the word. Um, but the one in charge of this, that he's he's received this talent and he didn't do anything with it. He didn't really fear God. Because if he did, he wouldn't have hid the talent. So if we're going to go at this, if we're going to go at understanding the righteousness of God, to study the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, we're going to study the message that God has given to this church in the everlasting gospel, which is based upon a prophetic message. Adventism is based upon a prophetic message. If you take away the foundation of prophecy, you have nothing upon which to build a structure. You're just building it on sand, on man's opinions and ideas with no, no way to establish your faith in Christ. So this righteousness of, of, of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is the third angel's message. That is a prophecy, is it not? Because you can't, you can't believe in the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, without the prophecy that points to it. Correct. Right? The third angel's message is a message to be given to the world that the world does not have. 
They have bits of the understanding of these things, but they don't have the power because they don't have the prophecy, the conviction, the power of God to actually live a godly life. They can intellectually assent to these ideas. And that's the way we are as Seventh-day Adventists. We can intellectually assent to the ideas about righteousness by faith, but that doesn't produce righteousness by faith. We can be completely orthodox in our beliefs regarding justification, sanctification, etc., but never experience it because we never go at it in the fear of God. And we need to go out in the fear of God, seeking for his Holy Spirit to make it plain, plain to us, is what it should say. Because remember, he talked about this need of the Holy Spirit at the beginning. And because the Holy Spirit is going to show us our sin. And of course, you need the fear of God in order for you to see that you are a sinner. So the Holy Spirit brings this conviction and this power into our lives. It makes it plain so that we can actually see and glimpse God's righteousness. And when we have this revelation of the character of God, we are undone. We see ourselves as we truly are because that light shines in the darkness. And we, we open our hearts to that light. And that's so the teacher of righteousness may teach us righteousness according to righteousness. Now, that teacher of righteousness is Christ. But we, we have righteousness that isn't according to righteousness, right? We have the type of righteousness that we're righteous in our own eyes. We think we're better than other people. We're like the Pharisee who fasts twice in a week, pays tithe of all that he possesses. But he's not like this publican in his mind. And yet he is not justified. Only the publican is. So this is what we're, we're, what we're studying. We're trying to understand this message in this context. Now, we're going to go on and read some of, of number 13. We obviously won't get through it. William says, has a good Sabbath night. It's probably late where he is. Good night. Um, <clears throat> the last study we had here is an effort to get as plainly as possible before this people the difference between satanic belief and the faith of Jesus Christ. The difference between justification by works under the heading of justification by faith, the difference between that and justified justification by faith as it is, that was the effort, that was the aim. And you will remember how it was done and that brought us to the subject that is ever before us now, that we must have the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. And this can be, as we have found, only according to God's idea of righteousness and not our own. And in order to have God's idea of righteousness instead of our own, we must have the mind that can comprehend it. And that alone is the mind of Christ. Whoever has not the mind of Christ itself, whoever has not yielded up himself and all that he has and is and received the mind of Christ instead does not know and he cannot know what righteousness by faith is. He cannot know what justification by faith is. He may profess it. He may assent to it. He may claim it, but he cannot know it. For no man can know it with the natural mind. Let us turn now and read from the Bible where it says so. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14. But the natural mind receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. That is just the way the righteousness by faith has been treated by hundreds of people who profess to believe it. And now we would have to say millions. Elder Lewis Johnson, uh, the priests of the state church in Scandinavia preach it that way. Yes, the Catholics all preach it that way. With the natural mind, it belongs that way. 
and it will always be that way with the man who is not the mind of Christ. But the man who is not that mind does not know it. He thinks he is straight. He thinks he has got the righteousness of God, which is by faith. And yet, what he has is not so good, but what he has to do ever so much himself in order to patch it up and complete it. But yet he thinks that that is righteousness by faith. But the natural mind receiveth, natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. How can a man then know the righteousness of God with the natural mind? Now, I just appeal to you. I do not care who you are, whether you have ever heard of Christ before in your life. Now, just take that verse as it reads. How can a man know the righteousness of God for himself with the carnal mind, the mind of Satan? For that is what the carnal mind is. Now, can that man do it? The congregation says no. Can the mind of Satan know the righteousness of God? Again, the righteousness of God as expressed in letters, in words, in the Ten Commandments is the law of God. Now, all agree with that. There is not a Seventh-day Adventist that will not agree with that. The difficulty is so many people try to get the righteousness of God out of the law by the law. Some try to get it. No. They actually get it without the law by the faith of Jesus Christ, which is unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For now, and that means now, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Romans 3, 21 and 22. He who obtains it in that way has, has it. But I say we all agree, every Seventh-day Adventist will confess that the Ten Commandments express in letters, in words, the righteousness of God. Now then, the carnal mind is the enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. How then can the carnal mind know the righteousness of God? How can the carnal mind be subject to it? It cannot be, says the Lord. Then the man who has only the carnal mind, who knows only the natural birth, and has not the mind of Jesus Christ, the man who has not had, who has not had the natural mind of Christ there, cannot know the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. And now, just now, when the Lord wants to reveal to us the righteousness of God according to righteousness, to give us the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness. Now, as never before on earth, it is that we need and must have the mind of Jesus Christ alone. So Jones here, when he talks about this now, he's talking about the now in the context of the mighty angel of Revelation 18 having come down, correct? That's what he means by now. Would we agree with that? Agreed. Okay. Because he's seen that we are now at this place back then in 1892, that if we're going to face the, subject, the Sunday law, that we can't do that in our own righteousness. We can't do that with the carnal mind. You can't have a people representing Christ's character just with their carnal mind. They need the mind of Christ. So again, he repeats, now the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Is the mind of Christ subject to the law of God? Congregation, yes. Was it ever anything else? No. The mind of Christ was subject to the word of God always. The whole Bible, of course, is simply the drawing out of the law of God as it is in Christ. Well, then, was not the mind of Christ always subject to the law of God? To the whole word of God, just as it is, congregation, yes. There was never any hitch upon that. Wherever the word of God was read, how did the mind of Christ receive it? It instantly received it. He would not say, now, how can that be, I wonder? Don't you suppose he said, well, now I think that means this way. Didn't he say, are not you a little too strong about reading that text? Can't you modify it just a little? 
Did he ever get troubled over what the Bible said about anything or what the Lord would say? No. Whenever the word of God was spoken, the mind of Christ instantly responded. Now, we can see here in the context of what we've been studying, the issues back then. I mean, Jones is pointing out there are people, when Jones was presenting in 1888 and even presenting here, that didn't really accept what was being said in the word of God. Now, we know how that got manifested as well, dealing with, with Butler and then the opposition to uh, some things in the Bible are more inspired than others type of idea, that we could decide what is inspired and what isn't. And that this church moved towards a, a place where it, the scholar became the expert, that we needed biblical scholars, people who were taught after the manner of the world in order to to win the world, where in the end, the world just wins you. Now, is our movement been any different than this? Do we really accept the word of God? Didn't, I mean, this movement made up a creed. They made up a committee, which I was on. They just put me on it you know, the doctrinal, doctrinal analysis group, right? And we even did another committee to decide whether July 18 was true or not. Does that even make sense to have a committee to decide whether something is true or not? Especially when you stack the committee and already have the conclusion decided ahead of time. Is that according to God's word? We would have to know that it isn't. Now, this movement is in a crisis. And what is this crisis? How would we characterize this crisis? How would, how would we characterize the movement that this crisis is in the context of what Jones is talking about? What is the crisis that this movement is facing? The crisis of unity. Okay, a crisis of unity, right? So, um, I mean, that's a good way of looking at it. So we know that this movement prior to the present time has sought to bring about unity and they did it the wrong way, right? They had committees, they, they, they started to organize. Is that how you bring about unity? No, no. And, and of course we should have known that, right? It should have been eminently clear. Yeah, okay. Is it unity and outcome? What's that? It seems to me that unity is an outcome. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's, it, you know, as I've said many times, you know, unity is an individual work. That is, there's a work that has to be done in us individually in order to be united to Christ. Because if we're not united with Christ, or can we possibly be united with each other? Well, Christ has to be the basis for us to be in unity. Right. So the focus wasn't getting in connection with Christ. The focus was to reconcile ideas and that somehow the people attached with the ideas would then be reconciled to each other. But, you know, the thing I found about people is that um, even if you have the same ideas, you can be unreconcilable to someone else. Two people with the same ideas can still be unreconcilable. And why is that? Why can two people with the same beliefs not agree? 
I don't know if you have ever seen that. I've seen it happen many times, but. I would say it's because the basis of their beliefs are not in Christ, both of them. Right. So people believe things for the wrong reasons. Sometimes they believe things because it's going to advance them. They're going to have positions of power or whatever they imagine, some kind of benefit. And somebody comes along and believes the same thing as they do, professes to believe the same thing. But that person is seen as a threat. Because that person's going to get this position or this power, this thing that I'm wanting to have. And so they can't be reconciled. So belief is not how you bring about unity. Setting up a creed, having baptismal vows that are really just a creed, getting people baptized, it didn't produce the unity that the movement thought it was going to produce, whether that was even the intention of it. Um, because when you see somebody acting in a certain way and the results are always different than what they're professing to believe, what they say that they want the results to be, you have to assume that the results are actually what they want. Does that make sense to people? If somebody keeps saying, I want to have unity, for instance, but he keeps doing things that are going to create conflict, does that person want unity? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Yeah. So if and and so and that's why we have to be so very careful because we do want unity. But the question is, how does that unity come about? And it's definitely not me changing someone else. Because I can't do anything about anyone else. I can only do something about myself. Now, we could also have pe some people deny that there's any problem in the movement, that the problem in the movement is just the few people that they think are creating conflicts, such as me, right? So, so I have to be very careful. Am I actually causing this conflict? Is it something that I've done or said? Could unity have come about if I wasn't such a, a jerk, right? You know, that's, that's the question I have to ask myself, that all of us have to ask ourselves. Am I doing something? Am I unchristlike in how I deal with my brethren? Am I unfair? Now, you know, I've been looking over this document, which I, I showed earlier. Um, this is Joanne's study from last Sabbath, the Sabbath school, December 10th, 2022. And, you know, she is, from my point of view, I wasn't there, I didn't watch her presentation, but I would say that this, this appears to be and I could be wrong, but it appears to be attack upon this message. Now, we did a study here in this building this afternoon on this verse. It is not for you know, to know the times and the seasons. Now, this is, from, this is a title for a review and herald sermon, March 22nd, 1892. Now, I don't really want to go into this too much here at this point in that we don't really have the time to go through all of this. But I want to touch on something that when we look at this, uh, we know that the statement in the Bible says it's not for you to know the times and the seasons that the father has put in his own power. But you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost come upon you. Here I'll find this verse here. So, um, yeah, so it's Acts. I should remember that. Acts chapter one. So, this is Jesus' words just before he's going to ascend. Um, it is not for you to know the times and the seasons. Uh, which the Father hath put in his own power, but you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, 
And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, this word power here uh, has to do with your ability, right? It's not your authority, jurisdiction, liberty, power, right, strength. But the idea here is in the sense of ability. You don't have the ability um, because the, the father has put this in his own power. God is in control of the times of the seasons, correct? We can't control the times and the seasons. Now, this idea of knowing here, um, we can't, we, it, it, this has to do with knowing, um, what's the word to know? Absolutely, in a great variety of applications with many implications as shown at left, with others not thus clearly expressed, allow, be aware of, feel, uh, perceive, be resolved, understand, right? So there are things that we cannot understand regarding the times and the seasons, right? Would we agree with that? Yes. Okay. But it says ye shall receive power. Now, the word power here is dunamis, which means force. That's where we get the word dynamite from, this Greek word. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So even though this God has put these things in his own power, so they're two different uh, Greek words. They're not really the same word, but they show up as power in English. But there's something that God has put in his own power. It's something that we can't understand. But we can receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon us. We can witness of God, right? Is this verse saying that we shouldn't be understanding prophecy, time prophecy? Because if it's not for us to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, if we take the times and the seasons to refer to time prophecy, are we to understand time prophecy? Were we to, to understand the 2300 days? Not without truly looking at it. Right. So one is we know that we need the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. There are things that we can't know. We can't know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. We can't understand these things fully, but God can teach us step by step. Now. The reason I bring this up is in this context here, taking the Bible and accepting what it says. Yeah, we actually measure time, right? So, so God has asked us to measure time. He, he did this in the Apocrypha, but we're supposed to measure the time. Now, I take measuring the time as, as the watching and waiting. If you read this article by Ellen White uh, regarding, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, um, we need to understand what our present duties are, right? Because people are speculating upon all kinds of things. But praying, waiting, watching, and working is, is some of our present duties, according to this uh, the notes that uh, Joanne has here, right? Now, watching and waiting, we can know the events that are going to happen around us. We can see the signs of the times. Um, the other verse here that we often quote in connection with this is... Um, I believe the one I like the best is in, in Mark, just because it says a bit more. So this is Mark 13, verse 32. Of that day and hour knoweth no man, 
No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So is the time of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, is that the setting up of the kingdom of God that the disciples are asking about? Right? Because he's talking about that the Father has put in his own power. So when we look at this, they're going to, they ask him, when, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? So it's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Is this something that we cannot know until the Father speaks it from heaven? Of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Is that talking about the same topic? Do we agree that that's the same topic that's being uh, responded to here by Christ? Because if we were to take this as admonitions against time setting, that would have applied to the Millerites as well, would it not? Yep. Yeah, okay. And then he says, take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when that time is, when the time is. For the Son of Man, for the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore and know, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, even at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. So we all need to know that we, we must watch. Right. Um, in Matthew, it says, watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So it's a much shorter um, uh, idea of that verse. And um, right. And, and the, it's we're going to be rejected or rejected. Uh, directed to Luke 21, 24, uh, dealing with the times of the Gentiles. So this is another verse. Um, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword, shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Right, And there shall be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars. So this is actually going to end refer to the end of the 2520 for Northern Israel, um, which ends in 1798. But anyway, in watching, we follow, we follow the events that God has sent to us, right? So Samuel says, so we follow the events. That's watching and waiting. So when we look at the scriptures, can we just pick and choose which scriptures we want to read? Can we pick a, a scripture out of context? Don't we have to look at the whole scripture? Because if we do this type of, of picking and choosing, not just from the Bible, but from the spirit of prophecy, to get our own ideas of what God is doing with this movement, we're going to end up rejecting it in the end. Right now, the movement is divided. It's divided over... July 18th, it's divided over uh, Collins' prediction regarding Trump. It's regarded over the basic, the foundation of this movement. Now, we need to 
bring this movement in prayer before God. We need to bring ourselves as part of that movement and ask God to correct us. Because this message of righteousness by faith has been misrepresented in this movement. That is, there is this, this idea that righteousness by faith is not eating between meals. Now, is it important not to eat between meals? Yeah, there's value in it. There's, there's definitely value in it. You know, we eat two meals a day. Now, the odd time we might have something in the evening if it's not too late, if we've had a, a pretty busy day. But we, the vast majority of times, we eat two meals a day. Pretty simple diet. But does that make us righteous? No, it can't make you righteous. Yeah, you can't become righteous in that way. I mean, it's, it's something good, right? It's very good counsel. And obviously, it, if we don't follow the counsels that God can give, that God gives us, if we don't follow these counsels, uh, we put ourselves in danger, correct? But if we're treating our brother with suspicion, if we're maligning their character, we're spreading gossip and rumors, if we're not listening to them, we're shutting them out, even when we, to a large degree, agree with them, yet they're not on our side for whatever reason we've decided. We have the mind of Satan. We are opposed to the gospel. And we need to know it. We are not converted. We are not who we think we are. Even though we know lots of things. And this message of righteousness by faith cannot be separated from prophecy. As Jones is clearly showing. Because when he says it's now, we know what he means. And we can't just modify God's word. We can't pick and choose. We can't do like Parminder. But yet we are. We pick what we want. We cast out what we don't like. We twist the words of, of scripture to fit what we want. And ignore the whole counsel of God. So this is where we're at. And this movement is going to have to decide, each of us in this movement are going to have to decide what we're going to do with this crisis that we are in. So let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we lift up one another in prayer. We pray for those that we have feelings about, that we have thoughts and ideas about that are negative. We pray for them. But mostly we pray, Lord, that you can give us wisdom about our own situation. We, we know, Lord, that when somebody offends us, it says more about us than about them. Help us, Lord, to recognize why we are offended by our brethren. We know, Lord, that we need you. And we pray that you can be with us in the study tomorrow morning. Um, that the message from Dwight will be a blessing. And we ask, Lord, for wisdom on how we should proceed um, in this next week. We know that we are unworthy. And yet you love us and care for us. And you care for those who we even see as enemies. Help us, Lord, to truly love one another. We ask that we can have the mind of Christ, that your righteousness can be displayed in our lives. Be with each one. Give us a good rest this evening. That tomorrow morning, 
we will be able to sing your praises. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.